Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I ask that the, the text come up. Um, let's pray. Father, you call us saints. But sadly, we do not always live like saints. In fact, some even pretend. Heavenly Father, grant us discernment as we meditate upon your word. Lead us to truth and truthfulness. Lead us to Jesus, our righteousness. Heavenly Father, come and bless us and our meditation at this time through Christ our Lord. Amen. There are three obvious things that, I guess, fairly universally, but especially traditionally, have helped jealous society uh, and communities, countries. You have politics and the economy or governance and economy work. You have the family unit. And you have religion. Three powerful forces. And when it comes to, for us as Christians, or those in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we believe we're dealing with ultimate truth, as no doubt some others do. We have a, a strong conviction and that this is presented to us as ultimate truth with life and death implications. And most people and cultures have sensed there's something out there. And to try and receive blessing, to, to, to be on its side, to, to benefit from it rather than under its or in opposition to it has been an important. And generally, in human culture, organization and leadership is necessary. And when the Torah was given, when the law, the word of God was given to Moses, there was organization, priests were put in place. There was authority, there were rules, so that people could approach the holy in a beneficial way and order their lives in a good way to receive blessing. And of course, with the New Testament, this has really been emphasized ultimately in the eternal destinies. Life with God life apart with them, the new heavens and new earth, and what is called hell. And so, we're dealing with something very, very powerful, very deep here with regard to the Christian faith. And so, Christian leaders traditionally have had a lot of power. The religious leaders, because of their position and because they mediated God in so many ways, according to God's own institution in the Old Testament, had a lot of power. But as we know, with power, it can be so easily abused. I proclaim God's Word to others, and I am under that Word. The Word that I proclaim to others... I'm also preaching to myself, or have been in my preparation, and sometimes afterwards I think back to things I said and blush and are convicted by it, which is actually a good thing. It helps protect, does the Word of God. 
But we need to know what we're getting is true. With such power and privilege, not only mediating God's Word, but a very often connected part of a close community or wider community, like the LCA or other denominations, or in this case, Judaism, one can exploit and abuse the position. And this was particularly, possibly even more so, when people were somewhat less educated, but it can still happen very much today, and does. Jesus is critiquing, critiquing here false religion, distorted religion, the perversion of religion. And sometimes today we hear people criticizing Christianity for the hypocrites. We're not talking here so much about sincere Christians with a, a weakness and acknowledging that. We're talking about those who strut themselves around and lay things on people to exploit or plunder them to get privilege for themselves at the expense of others. And so, when people raise us, we can actually direct them back and say, hey, yeah, do you know what? Jesus said the same thing. In fact, come and listen to Jesus. Hey, and, and, and let's evaluate then on the basis of Jesus, are these things right or wrong? It gives us an immediate connection and a way forward. Um, Jesus, who we believe to be from God, is against the distortion of religion. So let's have a look here. Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, he had been growing in increasing tension with the religious leaders. He had cleansed the temple because they were abusing their position there, ripping people off in all sorts of ways, turning what should be a time of fellowship with God and helping the people in this um, into a marketplace, a monopoly, using the law and the sale of animals to feather their own nests. So they were really against him and he had told some parables that had really reinforced them. So they were setting traps for him e everywhere, the religious leaders. And Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, many of the teachers of the law, the rabbis and so forth, were also Pharisees, a very devout strand. Saint Paul, who was very well trained as a Jewish theologian, was also a Pharisee as well. So they belonged to this this movement within Judaism, which was especially pious and added man-made rules to the Torah to exalt their own piety, but also to get around a few rules they didn't like. Oh, I don't like this one, but I will do this and this and this instead. So then I don't have to care for my family or I can get rid of my wife or a husband or whatever, my wife usually because of the power structures in those days. So you must be careful to do what they do, but not what, do what they say, but not what they do. They sit in Moses' seat. So, okay, they do represent the tradition, but they so often pervert it, that's a problem. But they do not practice what they preach. They tie heavy, cumbersome loads, so these are the additional man-made rules, and put them on other people's shoulders, but they're not willing to lift a finger to move them or help them. So let's keep going. Everything they do is done for people to see, appearances, to help bolster their position, their status. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels of their garments long. Maybe in an airport or somewhere you've seen a traditional Jew with the, the black robes on or garb, and the, the little things dangling. Um, the phylacteries are often a little leather box um, containing little words from the Old Testament, from Torah, from the books of Moses, little verses, but they make these long. They base it on verses found there, like um, 
Moses says, um, teach your children, write his law, his Torah on your forehead and on your arms. So they actually did this literally, instead of ingraining it into you, they, they made these little leather boxes with long strings and they added lots of them. So they're walking around looking very pious, they're often in, in black. And they make their tassels on their garment long. Tassels were little leather strips to remind them of the Word of God. And Jesus himself, we're told in one of the Gospels at a certain point, I think it might be Matthew's, that he wore tassels, but not this big outward display. We have a bit of a joke amongst some of us pastors. Um, We say, the bigger the cross, the greater the aspiration to be a bishop. So if a new pastor comes in and he wears a big cross, we, we say, well, this one has aspirations for a bishop because it seems the higher up the ecclesiastical ladder you get, um, the bigger the crosses suddenly become that the um, leaders wear. Now, look, in an official office, I think it's good to have symbols, but the point is the whole behavior has to go with it. We can't hide behind our symbols, our image, in order to exploit it, abuse it. So, in some ways, I have a unique role here. The heads of our various institutions have unique roles. Our bishops and other pastors have unique roles. But even in our committees, we, we are privileged to be on there, on our boards and committees, but we also have responsibilities to represent Christ rightly. There was even as time went by in the synagogues something called the Moses seat, the seat of Moses, where the person delivering the message would sit for the day, whether it be a rabbi or or just someone recognized in that community as particularly devoted and informed. I fill the office of the ministry. I represent Christ in a unique way. There are privileges that come with that. Less so as time goes by and our society and the status of the clergy and the the church is falling, but there is still privileges that go with that. But also enormous responsibilities. And in a sense, we all represent Christ. There's a message here. But We can easily, people can say a few God words and then just build their own empire. They can say a little bit of God speak here and there just because that's what's expected, but their hearts and the rest of their actions, they can tailor their message for their audience, whereas the Bible says, God says through Isaiah, don't go over to them, let them come over to you. We are to build bridges with others, but to bring them here, we are to stand firm, we are to represent Christ faithfully and truly. Consumeristic religion is rampant today. To the right and to the left. As I've mentioned before, there are those that are selling miracles and exploiting people. On the other side, there is this hip, cool Christianity, and there's a lovely Lutheran satire um, video that I will send out with the link for you to watch and encourage you to watch it, which exposes all the different forms of this in a a very relevant and pertinent way. It's only just been released, it only goes for four or five minutes, but it shows all these different expressions of hip, cool Christianity, but at the expense of Christ, crucified and risen for us, and His Word as revealed in the Scriptures. There are tweaks and tweaks and tweaks. The most obvious one for many, and the one that actually turns a lot of people off, are the prosperity gospel type people who sell miracles, who peddle religion, who weigh on people's superstitions, their ignorance, their emotions, their vulnerabilities. And one of them that's really well known, I've mentioned him before, 
is Benny Hinn. The man with the white suit speaks with a little bit of an accent, draws massive crowds into Auditorium, and his son, Costi, was, his, sorry, his nephew, Costi, was a part of his team. Costi vetted people for the miracles. He would get out people who are obviously incurable or, or people who weren't emotionally vulnerable so that the people that would be taken up on stage would be the people that could appear to have a miracle. And he, he, he has since converted, he has become a small orthodox minister in an evangelical congregation holding to the truths of Christianity, but he said he was often listening in on arguments how the editing needed to be done better to, to make it appear as these television shows went out that miracles were really happening. There's a whole fraudulent thing happened, happening here. But he also talks about other churches and influences through the whole charismatic movement from a few sources, one of them Bethel Church in Reading in California and a pastor by the name of, I think it's Philip Johnson. And the music they use to bring people in, but then what happens? We're just going to have a listen to this couple of minutes from this clip, just a real short excerpt, which I think comes under the fair use rule of YouTube. I would have loved to have shown the other YouTube, but um, copyright prevents it. So let's, let's listen here to, to this little clip, this little extract. How is worship music used to draw people into a prosperity gospel, Costi? It's a huge aspect of the prosperity gospel because music is something that people love and they enjoy today. And to be honest, it's very easy to draw people in with music because music is so universal. Mm. Uh, somebody might hear a preacher and have opinions right away and say, oh, I don't like this preacher or I don't like his teaching or that's unbiblical. But music can be a gateway because you could have a band that sings amazing songs, they sound really good, and everybody feels good about it, and you don't really know that they're actually false teachers mm -hmm. or that they're linked to false teachers. Mm -hmm. And I've even heard different teachers that preach uh, dangerous doctrines say – the music we produce and the bands that we promote are gateways to our teaching. They, they're trying to draw people in through the music because once you have people and their heart and their interest, whatever you teach them, they're like sheep and they can easily be led astray. Yeah. And so music is definitely a, a huge part of drawing people into false teaching. And that is the goal. And it was actually Bill Johnson who said that the music is the gateway to their, to their teaching. And you're absolutely right there. We are one, you're one click away from entering into a world that teaches that Jesus was just a man mm -hmm. in right relationship to God, that he laid aside his divinity. Those are things that are, are bona fide heresies. And Bill Johnson will teach those. And both of those, he says in multiple books, uh, one book in particular is called when heaven invades earth. And he preaches it in different sermons and the idea is Jesus was just a man in right relationship with God who was doing signs and wonders. So guess what? You can do them too. And then they'll say, just pay, pay tuition and come to our school yeah. and we'll teach you how. Yeah. And the way that they exploit young people is through the arts. And unfortunately, a lot of that is linked to music. Yeah. And often it isn't actually that the, the lyrics, uh, you know, they're, there's no, they're not heretical. It's actually the fact that sometimes they, they'll pass a Christian smell test. It's it's the fact that they are a gateway. And also, you know, churches are actually supporting these ministries as well, because through the CCLI licensing agreement, they're actually going to be making a lot of money through churches singing their songs as well, right? Yeah, they are able to make a massive amount of money through that. And so let's say you have a song that has great theology in it and it sounds great and people love it. Well, if you are singing a song that is written and produced by Bethel, um, you are directly supporting their ministry by purchasing the music. They're going to get royalties from that and it funds their heresy. And you and I both know that 
the enemy, the devil, does not show up at the foot of people's beds with a pitchfork, you know, saying, here I am to deceive you. You know, I'm a false teacher. Or I'm yeah. going to come after you. He's subtle. Yeah. He uses those to appear to be workers of righteousness, Paul tells the church at Corinth. And it's the same way today. Mm -hmm. These groups and movements have many things that they teach that are truthful, but it only takes a drop of poison to poison a whole barrel of water. And that's what they do. They are teaching one, two, or three very core fundamental heresies covered up by many different truths. And they would affirm with their doctrinal statements, and they'll affirm even on certain interviews, oh, we believe this, or oh, yeah, we believe the Bible. But what they teach and do is different. And so very important that churches can discern rightfully the word and also know what is essential and what is non-essential. And then when it comes to Christology or the teaching about Christ, mm -hmm. and when it comes to the gospel, those are essential. We yeah. can never get those wrong. We were called. Okay. Let, let's be clear what, and what I am and not saying here. I am not making a blanket damnation on whole wings of Christianity. What I am saying is there are very influential, and Bethel influences enormously, um, a whole wing of Christendom um, that are actually saying that Jesus is just a man. Outright heresy. Now, the songs that may come out from Bethel or other churches some of them, and a number of them, may be orthodox and singable, but the question is, should we use them if they're coming from such a source, and if um, their money is going back to help sponsor that source? It, and are we promoting false teaching, and other distortions. That was just one very obvious one, but other distortions in practice. So, um, and I'm definitely not saying all contemporary music is bad. I mean, Stuart Townsend songs, How Deep the Father's Love and in Christ Alone. Um, the son of an uh, Anglican clergyman, his father died, you know, and spurred him on, I think, to... And the Lord's My Shepherd, he does a lovely rendition of that, that we used... Um, so, so be, be prepared to hear what I am and not saying here, but I'm opening this up for discussion amongst us. Um, even where a song is orthodox, if, if it is from a heretical or a church that is promoting something dangerous, and of course Costi Hinn comes right from the inside of that movement and knows what he's talking about, and he has seen the people burnt and hurt and left shattered. Um, and the blasphemy against the church from so many outsiders because of this fraudulent, even when these people are sincere, sincerely deluded, awful mess, should we be promoting? It's a good question. So they, they have this appearance of religiousity, but according to Costi himself, while he was with his uncle, they were living literally rock star lifestyles. Shopping at the best, staying at the best, and we're talking 10,000 a night apartments or places, even more. Um, and on it goes. Limousines, the, the rock style lifestyle, they were living at the expense of poor, broken people who couldn't afford it, one, and two, who were left even more chewed up and spewed out afterwards. There's much more to be said in this text. Um, these people like the greetings. It's not that Jesus is against titles here or going to banquets, but those who l use their position for themselves, for popular acclaim, for self-aggrandization at the expense of truth, at the expense of faith, at the expense of the well-being of those whom he came to save. It was true then, they even crucified God. Let us not be the crucifiers of God by crucifying his true representatives amongst us, but support them and hold to account 
those who err so that the truth of God may be proclaimed. And the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We join in 